look at the little thermometer. We are live here again with our panel. Um, I am Jean Donaldson of the Academy for Dog Trainers. We also have staffer Christy Benson of the Academy for Dog Trainers and two of our honors grads, Emily Priestley and Lisa Skavinsky. And our topic today is why are we still talking about this? Uh, and what this is, is the use of aversives in dog training. Um, and so it's been amply demonstrated by both the research. It's been a, in the last 10 or 20 years, there's been a relative just avalanche of new research about uh, safety, efficacy and side effects. Uh, and also the many thousands of practitioners out there in the real world working behavior cases. It's been amply demonstrated that outcomes can be achieved without the use of aversives in training. And we're talking about positive punishment and negative reinforcement. Today, we're going to tackle how it is that we're still, that this is still remotely up for discussion in 2023. It should be said that things are much, much better than they used to be, and they're continuing to march in the right direction. England just announced that they are banning the use of electric shock uh, as of 2024. It used to be that force-free uh, force trainers were a fringe group. Then we became mainstream. And now the force-free trainers that I know cannot keep up with the demand for their services. We in the academy are minting competent uh, force-free trainers, but this is a slow process. Nevertheless, it's clear that things are moving in the right direction, and I think that aversives using trainers are feeling increasingly more cornered, which might account for the recent bubbling up of their attempts at legitimacy. So we're still talking about whether or not it's okay to hurt, shock, and scare dogs in order to train them. So here's our first question. What do we think about this recent fad of saying it's all the same? We shouldn't use the term force free. We should be inclusive of trainers who use aversives. There's no difference. What do we think about this? I, I admit myself, I find it um, a little bit alarming and a little bit disheartening. And I think it's, it's you know, we've been, we've had like decades of, of, of work where we've been sort of trying to separate out ourselves and trying to be like, um, you know, aversives are bad and unnecessary and they cause damage to dogs and they cause damage to the relationship people have with their dogs. Um, and then all of a sudden, it just seems like in the last couple of months, there's been a bit of an explosion of, of people on our side, our colleagues sort of pushing back and saying, no, um, as long as everybody is educated in the tools they're using, it's, it's all the same. Um, and it, it, like, I feel like I'm doing a bit of a mind explosion about it. Um, and in some ways I feel like I, I sort of want to look at my colleagues and say you're you're doing you're doing the marketing for them for for your shock using um, you know sort of uh, colleagues in dog training you're doing their marketing you're helping their cause and and just 15 minutes ago weren't we all trying to sort of um, you know we were all signing petitions to to get shock outlawed um, so I, I I have to admit I I do find it a little bit alarming and and worrisome and and you know. Um, I know this is something Jean, you and I have talked about before, but I feel like if if I look at something that I'm going to put out publicly to the public, to my colleagues as dog trainers, um, and and I say if if at the end of what I, I'm writing, if the end of my message is that shock collar trainers are going to be laughing all the way to the bank, that's a reasonable metric to me to 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 say, hey, that's not something I should be saying. You know, th that's an easy line for me to not cross. Emily, you were saying before, just before we we went live, that that doing so sort of sort of you know this inclusivity attempt it's not encouraging them to change or grow right i think all of us agree that we we want to support and be there for people who want to cross over no none of us are saying that we don't but i think that the way that we're going about it right now or the way that it's being suggested that we go about it it's really not about have helping them it's about allowing them time and allowing them to do their own thing and i really don't think it's encouraging people to cross over i think it's enabling people to continue using harmful techniques and i think we have to be very clear about that you know it's one thing to to embrace and help people cro like cross over from bad techniques and tools it's another thing to say like take your time you know you've already had decades to be behind the times take more, take as much time as you need because during that time the reality is is that dogs are being physically hurt and emotionally scarred so that's where i think we have to be very careful about how 
or what what our our goal is when we're saying let's be inclusive if we're going to yeah, hijack not, that it's not work. being mean to them or somehow nasty to sort of say no it's not okay to do that i've i've been wanting to pose a question to the trainers on our side who are saying there are no sides it's all the same if they had the power to make electric shock illegal in their own jurisdiction would they do it and if they had the power would they reverse it in the jurisdictions where it is already illegal if their answer to that is yes, they would like to make it illegal, then they're saying that the trainers they think are no different from them are doing something they would like to make illegal. Which is it? Um, it it's logically indefensible. And I, I, I you know, worry about sort of the, the failures of thinking um, in sort of the recent attempts to just sort of, it seems like just sort of throw around the word inclusivity or be nice and that, that somehow it's fashionable to do so, but it, it just lacks basic logic any other thoughts because now I, I think the next thing we want to talk about is the government so the governments that have already um made things like electric shock and in some cases things like prong collars illegal then they're ahead of at least in the u.s the some of the humane societies here so what what about that Yeah, it's certainly, I mean, I think this is where it really depends like place to place too, because I can speak for like here in British Columbia, I think our SBCA is, is ahead of the governments and like the bylaws and the municipalities, but it, you can only go as far as the law will allow. So, you know, do we, do they allow for harsh discipline and training or do they endorse that? They don't. But when, when the governments are saying, you know, it's out of our hands, there's nothing we can do, or we're not going to get involved in that, or it's, it's not, it's not where we're going to put our time and effort. Then the, you know, for example, here, the BCSPCA is only able to enforce provincial legislation. So there's only, even if they wanted to wipe out shot callers, which right. they do, there's only so far that they can go because they're being thwarted by something that really is, I mean, they can, they can certainly be involved in, you know, pushing for change and they do that in many ways, but well, um, advocates. Yeah. Even if they can't, have, they can't make laws, but can they have clear policies, which would then encourage governments because encourage uh, governments might very well take the lead from humane societies about what is and what isn't okay. And I think sometimes governments uh, are going to be thwarted in any attempts to do so if the humane societies are not unified. Yeah, I mean, and there's, it's like one fish to fry too, right? When we're talking about these things, there's so like, it's big on in our world, but in the, in terms of like, you know, if we even talk about British Columbia, like there's farm animals, there's, there's wildlife, there's so many other things that, Issues. you know, yeah, it's just, and it, this is where I think we have to really put the pressure on the individual trainers that we really have to start making. We, you know, a professional trainer who's taking money to from a client to work with a dog they need to have the pressure put on them that they need to make good choices they can't just say like it it really comes down to just starting to hold us hold our own accountable if we're going to call them our own hold everybody accountable and really like they it's not time to just let them sort of play house and be out there you know hurting dogs in the process because we the governments and the SPCAs and like they're it's a it's a snail's pace essentially I think is what I'm trying to get at and so where how do we like do we do we say like just take your time and be we'll be inclusive and we're going to accept everybody for what you know whatever they're doing or do we say you as a professional need to now be held accountable like at but what point mention. are we going to start I mean, the knowledge when you do that, you're green lighting people making money on the broken backs of dogs. And at the end of the day, is that something that we're okay with? Um, especially when um, the result is so frequently that we end up with, you know, booking five months, seven months out sometimes um, for dogs that were ruined by these um, processes, by these methods, by these tools. Um, I don't know who we're doing any favors for, not for ourselves, not for the dogs, not for the families. So just saying it's okay, it's all okay, take your time. There's plenty of people for whatever reason, and I, and I don't know what the reason is, um, that just have zero interest in the animal learning aspect of it. They have zero interest um, in, in learning to do it differently. I don't know why. And I know, you know, Laura Giuliano one time said something that kind of has stuck with me forever. 
why is this so hard? And we don't know why. We don't know why is this so hard to get people to make an effort to learn. And I, I don't know and what it, that is. And it um, certainly isn't helping that the sort of the recent, you know, sort of it, like Christy said, you know, some, some of the people on our side sort of, you know, thinking that they're doing something brand new, which is, well, let's sort of, you know, build bridges and let's sort of, you know, like uh, offer education. Let's not, you know, it's, it's all the same and trying to be done. inclusive. That's been tried. Yeah. Um, and and, and, and the, lame, tried. The, the lame arguments being Put forward it's the same one saying you know they're conflating taking a clear ethical stance with an ad hominem attack um they're conflating the occasional inadvertent or the unavoidable use of aversives with the systematic training methods of using aversives they're lame tired aversives or death we have to use it as a last resort argument and lisa we were talking just beforehand about this sort of kind of again it's it's logically indefensible this well it's this we have to save it as a last resort for those those cases where nothing else will work so it's being framed as this big gun that we use as a last resort and at the same time they're saying well you know really it's not so bad you know it's just like a little tap on the shoulder well, wait a second if it's just a little tap on the shoulder how is it this last resort big gun which is it Right. Um, you know, so they're just, and, and we just fail to even think about this and think critically about it. And think, you know, this is, this is, you know, the, it just makes no sense. And the core question of, is it okay to hurt dogs, to train them? Yes or no. Um, is it okay as a last resort? Is it not okay at all? Do we need to do it? Uh, uh, you know, and again, the research is sort of already weighed in. So any thoughts about why they do it? So you know, so the, the education, as we've said many times, the educational opportunities have been there now for, for decades. And so the and fewer people are now using aversives, but the people who are holding out, those who are still hanging on um, for dear life to their their shot callers, why are they doing it? What is going on in these people? Do they believe the, the rhetoric that they're using? Or what, what do we have any ideas or hypotheses about why these people do what they do? For some of them, I think, and I think this goes with humane societies too, because humane societies in you know, my experience are human institutions and they're very much led by the humans who are in charge. And if so, if we have humans who are in charge who have a particular idea or method, or if we have a dog trainer who's been doing something for, you know, something that they learned from, you know, their parents or they've been in business for 20 or 30 years, they have they're they're gonna be like, you know what? It presented with this idea that I can do it another way, I have to look back at my experience over the last five, 10 years and say, wow, I've been hurting dogs needlessly. So we get dissonance. that like dissonance. And I think, I, th I think there's a ton of that. And I think it takes a very, very brave person. And I know I, I suspect we've all done it, right? We've all been through this. We've done the grieving. We've done the self journey. It's hard stuff. It makes you feel like crap. But then you come out the other side and here you are. Now you're a warrior for dogs, right? Um, so I think there's a lot of people who are still on the other side of that who are like, no, I can't accept that there's another way because if I do, I'd accept that I have to judge myself. And that is painful stuff, man. And they're never going to have been an early adopter. Yeah. No. <laughs> hey, think about the number of people um, just, you know, in academy groups alone that are crossover trainers. Gene, you are a crossover trainer. Of course, you crossed over. Very, stuff very I used to do. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm thinking of people like Nicola, who's just um, just a brilliant trainer and a wonderful person. And, you know, there's so many folks that that have crossed over. It's, it's you know, it's. Yes, yeah, not that we don't know how to do it. Why you, yeah. As soon as they're given exposure to information yeah. that makes sense, they, they, I think there's a I mean, I. I risk saying this, but um, there's a lot intellectual curiosity. And then part of it is indoctrination. If you're part of something, if you're, um, if you're immersed, you're, you're in a tribe, people are right, tribal. right, right. And, and humans, as we all well know, are very tribal. I mean, this is, this is what we do. I think part of it is that, um, and if you feel at all questioning what you're doing, all you have to do is go back to your tribe and you're stirred in, in those it's validated part of it is that. So you know, which works right hand in hand with cognitive dissonance, right? Um, it, it allows for that um, support. No, you're doing it right. You're doing everything right. So I think it's difficult because part of it is what people you're exposed to. Um, but we can, my, my concern is that why are we saying that we have to say what they're doing is okay. We can say these tools and methods are unnecessary. They're side effect laden. 
they, they harm dogs, they harm people. We're absolutely happy to teach. I mean, I would give, I wouldn't even think twice about supporting somebody who wants to cross over. Most of my clients are people who come to me using those, you know, Emily, you were saying that at our last thing. I absolutely expect some of my clients, many, most of my clients to come in having been given misinformation, having been using tools and methods that that are not helping them or their dog in a, in a way that we need to. Um, and it's with absolute um, support and lack of judgment that, you know, we support folks. I think it's different if you're a trainer for, for profit. I feel- And you're aware. We're charging money, have an obligation, a professional obligation to follow the science that I strongly feel that. So saying it's okay if you're just eschewing all this, it's okay if you just don't care that the side effects have been demonstrated over and over and over again in so many published studies. It's, it's okay if you're just ignoring that, just keep doing you. It just doesn't make any sense to me. No. No. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I can speak to, I was not, a, I guess I was not a crossover trainer because I didn't, I didn't use those tools or techniques when, when I was a trainer, but certainly as a, as a pet dog owner, I did, um, going way back. And I think, you know, one of the big problems for me back then was, and is still to this day, and this is where I really empathize with clients is that this stuff is all packaged as fact. And so when you're a well-meaning person and you go out and you're looking for help, and you find stuff on the internet that is all worded by people that don't have any concept of animal learning or the fallout, but it's packaged all as facts. It really can sound legitimate and it really can sound good. And how do, how do you know as a, you know, especially if you're in a desperate sit situation with your dog. Um, right. But for me, the crossover came from education. And I think that's the, that's the thing It's is it a comfortable process? No, I don't think it necessarily it is, is, especially when you start to realize like, what if I've actually been doing harm here? <laughs> you know, that's not, a, that's not a great place. Right. But this is where you like really making sure that you understand the background, like that, all of the animal learning stuff. And that's where, like, for me, that's where the change came was really understanding what was happening, not just how it was packaged or how, you know, it sounded, it sounds great. Packaging. But when you started to unravel that, what's, what's really underneath that? And it's not always comfortable, but I, I can, I can empathize with where people are coming from in that we still do a very poor job of explaining, getting the truth through to people without it just sounding like he said, she said, or like my word against hers and, or theirs, you know? So it's not a comfortable process, but, but it is possible. <laughs> and, and you know, it makes me, it reminds me of sort of the Academy push. It was some years ago that we did sort of a transparency push. We thought, well, while we're waiting for stuff like electric shock to be made illegal, we could at least require dog trainers to be transparent in their marketing to consumers about what they're going to do. So one of the things that always reminds me that I think people using averses are aware that they're on the wrong side of history, um, that society's kind of marching ahead of them, is sort of the increasingly obfuscating language that they use in their marketing on their websites where they, they sort of talk about, you know, every dog is different and we use something different. And it's really not painted very clearly that their dog is going to be subjected to electric shock, he's gonna be subjected to a collar that strangles him or digs pin, pins into his neck, et cetera. It's sort of framed in very kind of vague and obfuscating manner. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that's, you know, that, that to me is both sort of not an acceptable practice and also a sign that they know the the walls are closing in on them. Um, mm -hmm. The clients are being bamboozled. Like it, it's really- They are, and, and that's not okay. You know, okay, so if you really think electric shock is okay, then state it on your website. Say, you know, I use electric shock. I use it as a last resort. Um, I think it's necessary, um, you know, uh, uh, and, you know, if you don't like electric shock, you're going to need to go elsewhere. You I mean, you could say it in softer language, but you need to sort of say that. Um, just as we need to say, you know, I'm going to use food to motivate your dog. Um, you know, that, that you know, we need to be sort of clear about these these things so that that pet owners can make an informed decision. And then I, I feel like, so the, the, the terms, you know, the term evidence-based gets thrown around a lot. And for me, that's kind of the clear delineation. It, it's not just that they're not saying this is an electric shock. It's, it, you know, 
it's everything from the motivations of dogs, like dogs are being disrespectful, dominant, like all of these um, human constructs that um, we can use. Not helpful. It feels okay to use coercion. And then to say that it's not really coercion, it's a gentle tap or a gentle stim, or um, it's like, you know, a prong color is like a mother's correct, gentle correction from a mother's mouth. All of these things that are not evidence-based. Here's the thing, positive punishment and negative reinforcement of course they work. Saying of they course they work. And, oh, but, I mean, we're all motivated right. by threats to, but to life and limb. Right. And that's the thing. Let's be clear about what that is. Dogs will work to avoid the things that hurt and scare them. But we also evidence-based includes what the known predictable side effects of those methods are, right? So telling owners that their dog's doing something for some real kind of squirrely, um, deviant reason and then saying, we're just going to use a gentle stim, not calling it what it is. It doesn't hurt the dog. It doesn't scare the dog. So, you know, what is the definition by which you think this works? So this whole thing about evidence-based, it's not just about whether or not you can um, exploit fear and pain to suppress a behavior. And, and by the way, it's not calm submissive. It's a very well-studied, you know, phenomenon known as learned helplessness. It has very serious welfare implications and a very serious side effect profile. So kind of couching all of these things in such a weaselly way, it, that's not evidence-based. These tools work in a specific way. We do know what how they work. Be honest about it. Be honest about the side effects of it. And that's what we're not seeing. And that's the concern. And I guess if you're gonna continue using these methods and tools, in an era where, where it's very well documented and very well studied that what you're doing is dangerous and bad, then you have to come up with euphemisms to make it sound like it's not. No, no, nobody who, who owns a dog who loves their dog wants to say, okay, well, I'm gonna have to hurt and scare them to suppress a behavior that I don't like. And so they don't say that, but I think we have to be honest. And, I, and that's not what we're seeing. So evidence-based matters. And I don't think that until people start being, until everybody understands animal learning and everybody understands behavior, and, you know, and everybody's honest about what they're doing, I don't think it's okay to say, everybody do what you want. Owners need to have clear information. They need to understand what trainers that they're paying money to are going to do to their dog and what that and what the outcome of that will be. And they need to be able to make an honest and informed <laughs> decision if they're okay with it. They you could end up with a, a, a terrible fear side effect. They need to know that in advance. Yeah. I mean, it, it really is like surgeons disclosing, you know, the possible things that can go wrong in a surgery. Um, and I think because right now we're in this moment where our colleagues are, are saying we have to stop being upfront. That's essentially what I'm hearing. We have to stop being upfront about Don't these be side effects. And I think because, because, the you know the the sort of use of shock is often put forward as this necessary thing. Um, it's wrapped up in this language that's really compelling to people. Gene, I remember watching a webinar you did about why people like to punish so much, and it's just something about people. We like to punish. It like do. the the phrase lights up pleasure centers in our brain. Stuck with me, right? So it's something interesting about us. We like to punish. Now that we know that, you know, we need to sort of set that aside and be like, okay, so ju just because that's something that we like doesn't mean we need to do it. Doesn't mean that it's right that we do it. Um, so I think that the fact that you know that it's being sold in this compelling way um, means that we, as force-free trainers, have to be upfront and honest. It's it's our dude. It's our duty, I think, to to sort of be like, hey, I I know that feels really compelling. I know that 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 dishing out punishment feels, feels really right. good to humans. Yes, but but here's the thing, you know, I, we yeah we have this we have a very deep innate urge to punish transgressors. Um, he, um, Chris, could you talk a little bit about, you brought up um, this discussion recently that it, um, somebody was saying, I think it, it was a webinar or a podcast, that bad R plus training is as bad as, as bad versus training. And, and that, 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 you know, so that, that came out of somebody's mouth. Like, how does that even I, uh, track? No, I guess, so I have, I have two sort of buckets of thought about that. Number one, yes. There needs to trainers should be educated. Dogs deserve educated trainers, and I think people who go into the business incompetent with good heart, not, nobody's sanctioning incompetence here. No, and I, I so I think that we can accept that as true, but also say, wow, 
people who don't have skills who are handing out cookies are not going to be doing the same type of damage as people who don't have skills and are shocking your dog. So, so I, those are so vastly, those are polar opposites, right? And, and, yet, so and yet, that, that, that is not obvious. That, that is not obvious to somebody. It's, it's like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> somebody yeah. thinks that that's not obvious. The incompetence yeah. is the enemy no matter what. But if you got if all things held equal, incompetence is the thing, then you either have pain or you have treats. <laughs> right, right. What get, yeah, can't we hold two thoughts in our head at the same time that you right. can be competent and not use aversives? Right, right. <laughs> Isn't that the goal for everybody? And why is it not? <laughs> right. yeah. right. And then you're just conflating using food, essentially, you know, so, so broadly using food and using shock by saying those are the same. And I'm just like, hey, those yeah. those are not the same. Yeah. I, I don't think any per human and I don't think any being with a body would say, yeah, those are about the same. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Those are both, I mean, it, it baffles me. I, I recently saw, you know, a couple months ago when all this, you know, kind of nonsense before came out. One well-known person saying, you know, Honestly, teaching dogs to do anything that's not natural for them, whether you use rewards or, or sh it's, it's all aversive, you know, even if you use treats and positive reinforcement, it's just yeah. as happening to the dog than as yeah. using it. Yeah, I sort of feel like we get it from, from all the sides. Yeah. You, Listen, know, like, oh, God, you know, if you use a timeout that that's somehow bad, but now it's okay to use shock. Well, no, it was um, worse than that. You have to be nice to, to all trainers. And, right. oh, and, you know, and if you teach dogs to sit, that's somehow bad. Or a DRI right. is now coercive. And like, it's it seems like this sort of attempt almost to muddy the waters. Yeah. Um, And the muddy, who does the muddy waters benefit? If I was a lawyer, who benefits from the muddy waters? Not us. <laughs> Not, not us, not yeah, not dogs. Dog. <laughs> not dog. Um, you know, so what, might we be might we be clear about some things that yeah, we can certainly have a side discussion about. You know, wow, it's really good trend to have let dogs express more of their normal behavior. Sure. Let dogs be dogs more. Give them enriched lives. What do we really need to train to help them fit into our world more? And how are we going to do that? And then that's one discussion, but it's a whole other discussion. Is it okay? I mean, if you were a dog, say, yeah, you were going to get to do more of the things that you want to do. And we're, you know, we're not going to sort of, you know, you know, constrain your behavior so much. Um, but do we also want to talk about whether it's okay to electrically shock you? <laughs> you know, might that be important? I feel like they would vote a certain way. You know, or say, the, you know, if you're saying yeah. the third graders, you know, or, you know, um, you were going to use electrically shock to help you with your times tables, you know, like, I don't know. <laughs> Like, is this, thing, yeah. why are we still talking about this in 2023? And I think it's, I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. The attempts to it's muddy. Getting the it's getting muddy. That's the weird thing. It's like, okay, we at least could all agree on a few things. Yeah. And now I'm hearing from people who actually sell programs to dog trainers that, you know, teaching a dog to do anything, even using positive reinforcement is aversive. And it's like, well, I don't know. That's not what an aversive is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you no, need to go. Know, it's animal learning. What is undergrad animal learning? Learning it. I feel pretty good about it. You know? It's a very weird again, but if you shock me every time I get a verb wrong, I would I feel very there's, there's <laughs> something really compelling about that argument. Going back to like as humans, we are compelled by some narratives. And I think that's like a cool thing about humans as an anthropologist. Very interesting. Yeah. So we're compelled by that. We shouldn't have to teach dogs anything argument because I feel myself compelled by it. But then I also think I'm going to German classes with Eugene every week and i'm learning something that's totally unnatural for me as an adult <laughs> and it's hilarious fun and it's so good for me so if it's i look at it's not yeah it's they're right. training their dog to back up in figure eights with treats go for it have fun man training is enriching so we can't say you can't train but but go ahead and enrich when we know training is enriching so i i feel like there's there's just something really crazy yeah, it's, it's something odd. Also, have you ever actually trained a dog? I, I look around my classroom. And Do you help actual yeah, 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 people are fashion. training downstays, not place, but downstays. And what 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 I love so much, and I point it out to my clients, is that you notice, you know, they'll ask for a stay, they'll go across the room, they'll add some duration, whatever the criteria is. And the second they start moving back, that dog's tail swishing, their tongue's hanging out the side. There's joy by the ability to read body language. There is no question that these dogs are enjoying the experience. They're cooperatively interacting with their owners in a really, really fun way. Watch some of the videos of people who are training it with a shot collar. Those dogs that are laying on those tundra beds 
where their tails are tucked and they're not moving a muscle and they've got, you know, very worried faces. The body language tells you everything you need to know. If you're actually training dogs using positive reinforcement, if you can't see the joy in that, that, that it's not aversive. That, that, that is, I mean, we fun. are, there is body language illiteracy still out there. Um, yeah. I mean, I think strides have been made, but that's a really good point that we're, you know, there's a lot of people who still don't read dog body language very well. Yep. Well, and even, even worse, probably, I mean, you know, you can train with positive reinforcement and some people do, and some people don't, but even worse are the people who are shocking or correcting dogs who are fearful and aggressive dogs that are struggling. Like, you know, when we're talking about figure eights and tricks and things like that, well, then these dogs are actually, these dogs are, are in desperate need of intervention. And then they're being punished because they're displaying behavior that indicates how they're feeling in an emotional state is like, it's frightening to me that we're still doing Mayors. this or that we still think that this yeah. is okay. Like, getting, you know, getting back to Lisa's sort of, um, you know, sort of teaching verbs and time tables and stuff to use using electric shock. That's one thing. But if somebody presented themselves to a therapist with an anxiety disorder, and then we're going to let the therapist going to electrically shock that person. I mean, that, that is a direct analogy. That's not hyperbolic. That is a direct analogy. So it really is disturbing that, that, that this is still passing for, for competent training. Yeah. Why is, why, why, why are we, why, why are some of the good guys, like Christy said, why, why are we still doing their marketing for them? Why are we helping them? Why are we enabling them to still do this? Yeah. Yeah. And partly I think it's that compelling thing. I think the idea of, of building bridges and the idea of being inclusive. Sounds good. Yes. It sounds it good feels, on first brush. Yeah. Can't that bridge be built for those who want to walk across it? Like that's there are bri the, the bridges are there for anybody. Yeah, the bridges who are there. Welcome. Across. Come on over. You right. Know? <laughs> right. But it doesn't mean, you know, they, but they must walk across the bridge. Somebody, they have to <laughs> want to. And honestly, aren't they a little bit offended? If I yeah, the bird bridges. Yeah. Either. Yeah. And yeah. I'm thinking this Trojan horse thing, like the idea that somebody's saying, we're going to, we're going to give you a pass. We're going to say, we embrace you. You can do that's not a bridge the whole purpose is so we can change you. Like I find that a little offense. I'd be more offended by someone saying, I'm going to manipulate you into change you versus someone say, listen, I'm not okay with these tools. I'm not okay with these methods. And you know, if you ever want to learn better, here we are. Yeah, yeah. See, it's kind of, it's not building a bridge to say it's okay to stay on your side of the bridge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I'm just gonna, I'm gonna kind of, you know, I'm gonna woo you into it. It's like the, you know, here's the information. It's out yeah. there for anybody who wants it. You need to do better. Yeah. And professional competency would mandate it. And here's the thing: any other any other professional industry in the world for which there weren't standard practices and an oversight body. We could, you know, that is a whole different conversation going into the fact that we Competence, don't have yeah. a regulatory body that is an, you know, unregulated industry. But imagine, imagine all of these other industries, if people could do it any way they, they Air, want. Aircraft maintenance. Right. And, and, and it goes. Causing more damage. That's the whole thing. The, the aversives or death thing. What we know from every study done is that when we exploit pain and fear, it, th there's there's side effects. So you're taking an already, um, as Emily was saying, you've got a, an animal who's already experiencing severe anxiety, um, and the behavioral, you know, the behavioral repertoire reflects that. You're going to start adding pain. You're going to start exploiting that anxiety to try to suppress the behaviors that you don't like that are indicative of the anxiety. I, I mean, how is that saving? That is, I mean, that is, that could not be more oppressive in the, in the true sense of sort of, you know, like, you know, 1984, two plus two equals five. That is, is, is inhumane, oppressive, and just plain not okay. Yeah. And ABSAB came up very clearly, very, very clearly saying, not only do we want to not use these tools in everyday training of everyday behaviors, but that includes dogs with fear and aggression. I would say, especially not dogs that are already yeah. struggling with fear and aggression. What yeah. are we crazy? <laughs> Who's doing this? And as somebody who has to be the mop-up squad day in and day out, I can promise you that's the true reflection. Almost, I would say I, the vast majority of my clients for fear and aggression, they come with a background of having been um, trained that way using aversive. <laughs>
And um, as we and as we get close to wrapping up here, I should point out that um, I don't know if it's already up, but it will be up probably very soon. Up on the Academy blog will be some case studies where we were the mop up squad because there is this narrative that somehow when positive reinforcement can't get the job done, you go to the big guns, you go to the aversive strangers, and they're somehow you know bailing out you know these these poor owners. And in fact, that is crazy because it means the, it's the opposite. Um, we are. Uh, you know, every day fixing the messes made by these trainers. And so there will be some case studies up on the Academy blog. Um, if not already, then that will be happening this week. Any final thoughts before we wrap up? I think one thing that just in, in the whole sort of speaking to our colleagues who are currently sort of maybe weighing whether or not they want to jump on the whole building bridges thing mm -hmm. that's going on right now. Um, is it feels when I when I look at what's been going on over the last couple of months that that our team, you know, the 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 people who don't use aversive tools in training, um, when we're reaching out, um, when I look at the people who are around us who are doing this reaching out thing, they're not reaching out to people who are balanced and mostly use positive reinforcements, but occasionally use a shot collar for like wildlife chasing. Like I, that's not what I'm seeing. What I'm seeing is that they're reaching out to people who already have a big audience, maybe you know who, but who are also very routine, routine readily users. using aversive tools on all dogs and and in in ways that are you know you know two shot collars per dog using putting shot collars on puppies on you know so just on sort of these alarming instances and i know there's tons of, of trainers out there who do that but i so i, I feel like it's not just that you know it, again it's just one more logical inconsistency we're not just being like hey you i can see that you have the appetite but maybe you don't have the skills on training xyz you know it's it's people who it if we're reaching out to people who have big audiences and who are using damaging tools at they have no appetite turn, yeah I, then I, I i'm extra alarmed we, and, yeah which then that. makes you wonder okay what what's the real motive there why are they yeah. doing this you know and it, i think it, i hate to say it I hate it's it's just yeah. warming is it, it as simple as platform and, and likes and and financial um are yeah. we that cynical to sort of think because that's what i mean on the face of it that's what it looks like is you know the the what happens is you know you end up with more more students sure. yeah yeah 100 oh, gosh it's hard not to see what is kind of to me very very apparent and i want you know here's the thing I, I don't i dislike conflict immensely um and i really wish that we could just say you know oh you know just it's open everybody's welcome type all comers and that that would work. I would give anything for that to work. Um, it doesn't. So it, to me, it seems a little bit alarming that you are choosing that these, these people who are reaching out, reaching across the bridge, they are cho choosing people who are, you know, big platforms, big aversives and yeah. strangely so made it has made, have made it clear for decades that their heels are dug in and they're going to do it this way. And, um, it's just a very bizarre thing. I think you're right, Christy. It's a, that that's who you choose. <laughs> It doesn't make any sense to me, you know? Yeah. Well, thank you, everybody. This was, uh, 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 you know, I, it's a discussion I wish we weren't having, but that we, we still have to have. Thank you. Thanks, Jean. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Bye.